Uh, if, if Locke thinks that our bodies are ultimately mysterious to us simply because all material bodies are in their inner nature mysterious mm. to us, and we're, and we're not even sure what our minds are either, mm. what view did he take of personal identity? What did he see people as being? Well, the um, discussion of personal identity is one of the most original and interesting parts of the essay. Um, he ag agreed with Descartes that one knew that one was a thinking thing, but one didn't know what kind of thing one is. Um, in the 17th century, the followers of uh, Cartesian modes of thought um, thought that a very powerful argument for their view was that it explained immortality that, uh, and, and personal identity that the identity of a person, despite the flux of matter, so to speak, in the body, the identity of the person is determined in life by the identity of the soul, and this soul could go on after, to the afterlife. I mean, and that would m constitute our identity then. Now, Locke started from uh, a, a different consideration, which is that immortality has to be personal immortality. The whole point of immortality is... Um, well, to put it bluntly, reward and punishment, mm. uh, with uh, a certain emphasis on punishment very often. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah. unless the, the thing that was being punished in the afterlife was conscious of the deeds that it had done in, in, the li in, in, in life on, on Earth, uh, then somehow Locke thought that punishment lost its whole point. So Yes, it they, would be as if a quite different yes. person were being punished. Right. Fact, so he way. argued that, I mean... Suppose we grant that there is such a thing as an immortal, immaterial soul, and suppose we grant that this um, receives punishment. If that thing has no recollection of what happened on Earth, the, the whole notion of immortality loses its point. So what really matters, Locke said, is not the, this supposed immaterial soul, but uh, consciousness. The consciousness of the individual, uh, which continuity. you the continuity of consciousness, yeah. the consciousness of, of the individual of its past, of his past deeds, and of course, in this life, what matters is um, the thought that it's going to be us who's oh. going, to, going to get punished in the in the world to come. In my introduction to this program, I referred to the enormous uh, impact that Locke's political philosophy mm. made. Uh, it, both uh, in the period that Locke lived in and, in fact, ever since. It's always continued to have an influence. So I don't want us to get off Locke and on to Berkeley before we say something about that. Mm. One, one thing that I admire, in fact, I think the thing I admire most in Locke's political philosophy is, is the clarion call for tolerance. And at least one of his arguments for that is based on his insistence that, after all, we don't really know all that much in this life. We are wrong about a lot of things. A great deal is mysterious to us. And therefore, we are not justified in imposing our opinions on others by force. He has a very moving expression of that argument at one point, which I like very much, I must say. Yes. Um, I think that is uh, an important uh, connection uh, with his uh, uh, views on politics and religious tolerance in particular. Um, he has a, what you might call an individualistic view of knowledge, that uh, nobody else can do my knowing for me. I mean, yeah. I have to uh, uh, think things out for myself in order to have knowledge. Um, other people can pass on opinions. Um, now, in uh, certain areas, in uh, ethics and, and uh, religion, he thought that uh, people ought to spend time and ought to be given the time to spend on thinking things out for themselves as far as possible. And uh, if you have that coupled with a very strong sense of how difficult this is mm. and how hard it is to get things right, uh, then you've obviously got the recipe for a tolerant society. Yeah, we take it for granted, but of course in his day it was very far from being taken for granted. What, before we do move on, I'd like you to sum up in some way what you see uh, Locke's lasting contribution to philosophy, or mo that's too big a question, what you see his most important contribution to philosophy as having been. Well, historically, um, of course, something that you hinted at before, 
but he supplied a framework within which people could make sense of things like Newtonian science and so forth. And uh, a, 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 way, a way of looking at the world in which um, we recognize that there's a lot about the world we don't understand, and we recognize the speculative nature of science and so forth. Um, and that was very important. Um, he had another effect, which was that some of his arguments, for example, his emphasis on the, on, on the point that uh, what the knowledge we, we get through the senses is really just knowledge of things with powers to act on us. We don't really understand what lies behind those powers. Those arguments were employed by philosophers like Berkeley himself, who, who were really aiming at a, quite a different kind of view of the world or philosophy from Locke's but were able to Im make use of what to them were concessions, concessions to um, idealism or to skepticism, I mean, to a different, quite a different sort of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that Locke has a lot still to say to us, partly just because he was, so to speak, the last great realist before the trend, the te tendency towards uh, idealist, philo idealist yes. philosophy. Yes. And, and we can... I think there's something deeply wrong with idealist philosophy myself, and I think that well, it's very valuable to go back to Locke as a sort of pre-idealist realist, and some, in some ways to see what went wrong, but also to see, to pick up um, points which we've forgotten, which well, we've lost. I have much more sympathy with idealism than you have, but let that appear as it may. Let's now move on to the first of the absolutely major idealists, namely mm. Berkeley. And in a way, we've prepared the ground for the step we're now taking, haven't we? Because the philosophical doctrine that Berkeley is most famous for is his rejection of the notion of material substance. He just said there is no such thing. Hmm. All we have is experience, and we've no warrant for inferring the existence of anything that isn't experience. Now, can you... I mean, that was partly a reaction against Locke. Can you... Does it well, start the discussion of his philosophy from that point? Well, the way you put it, you make Berkeley look like a skeptic, and he was, uh, I mean, he hotly contended that his philosophy was anti skeptical, and that he w wasn't doubting that there was something out there, in a sense. But what's out there is not the material world. Uh, he, he wanted um, the world basically to consist of um, spirits. With he thought the, the whole of reality was spiritual. Well, the sensible world is given a very sub subordinate role. I mean, he doesn't mm -hmm. deny its existence, he says, but he wants it to be in some way dependent on spirits. I mean, there's God and there are finite spirits. His motive is fundamentally theological. Uh, to his mind, the uh, philosophers like Locke and uh, Descartes had turned the world into a kind of God, almost, the, the, turned the, 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 material the material world. Yeah. Because matter is something which um, has a nature of its own which doesn't need God anymore in some way. Once God has created matter, it's like a great clock. It can go ticking on and uh, well, God goes on holiday. And this, for, for Berkeley, was a, a sort of atheistic doctrine, virtually. I mean, a, a lot of philosophers had thought that... that uh, uh, materialism was was uh, a source of atheism and that had attacked uh, any view which gave matter an e sort of equal status to spirit. I mean, uh, a group called the Cambridge Platonists or the Cartesians yeah. themselves yeah. were like this, had this view. But Berkeley was perhaps, well, one of the first to have the idea of turning the tables on matter in a way by making the sensible world nothing but... Uh, so to speak, something which is mind-dependent. Um, so that Locke's distinction between the world as it appears to us and the world as it is in itself, mm. you see, mm. is, it, Lock, Berkeley just chops off the world as it is in itself, and all that's left is the world as it appears to us. Mm. And he contends that he's not denying the existence of anything in this way, at least not the existence of anything that, uh, that counts or matters. 